All right. Well, thanks for, for joining us today. Uh, we're going to be recording this section today for the benefit of all of those who were not able to participate. And thanks for joining us here on WebEx, on Finger Lakes TV, Spectrum Channel 1304, Facebook or YouTube. And welcome also to those who are gathered in Lecture Hall 2775. Apologies for the, the, uh, the error. Uh, the, we advertised the room next door. Hopefully, <laughs> if you're watching this and intending to come to the room, you'll, you'll see the, the, the new room is 2775. If you are joining us online, uh, please make sure to keep your uh, uh, the audio button muted until the Q&A portion of the program, which will follow Dr. Bromwell's presentation. I'm Dr. Robert Brown, professor of history here at the college and organizer of the History, Culture, and Diversity series. Today's speaker is noted 18th century Anglo-American historian and award-winning author, Dr. Stephen Brumwell. Dr. Brumwell grew up in Portsmouth, England, in the shadow of one of the grandest castles of the realm, which is at Portchester on the Hampshire coast. Frequent visits there as a child ignited a lifelong passion for history that would lead him to attain an undergraduate first-class honors degree in history and ultimately a PhD at the University of Leeds. Dr. Brumwell's doctoral research served as the basis of his first book, Redcoats, the British Soldier in the Americas, 1775 to 63, which he published for Cambridge University Press in 2006. The international success of this work prompted Dr. Brumwell to leave academia and devote himself full-time to research and writing. He next turned his hand to biography and produced Pass of Glory, The Life and Death of General James Wolfe, this 2008 McGill University Press title challenged traditional interpretations of this iconic 18th century figure. It won both the Charles P. Stacy Prize for Canadian Military History and the Society of Colonial Wars of New York Distinguished Book Award. Canada's Globe and Mail newspaper observed, quote, every so often books are published that combine first-rate innovative scholarship and page-turning readability. Stephen Brumwell's revisionary retelling of the life of James Wolfe is a shining example, unquote. And you can see some of the other rave reviews in this slide. In 2012, Dr. Brumwell focused his attention on the American Revolution or the American War of Independence, as many Europeans prefer to call it, and produced a well-researched, balanced, an engaging biography of our founding father, Continental Army Commander-in-Chief, and First President. George Washington, Gentleman Warrior, won the 2013 George Washington Book Prize for the year's best work on the nation's founding era, 12, the 1760 to 1820 period. The citation that accompanied the award declared it, quote, well-written and engaging, in the hands of this fine biographer, Washington emerges as a flesh and blood man, more impressive than the mythical hero could ever be, unquote. Other recipients of the George Washington Book Prize, by the way, have included Ron Chernow, Nathaniel Philbrook, and Mary Beth Norton. This work also won the biography, uh, stroke autobiography category at the 2013 New England Book Festival. Yeah. Dr. Brumwell's latest book, Turncoat, Benedict Arnold and the Crisis of American Liberty, uses previously unaccessed primary source material to critically reconsider one of America's most successful revolutionary era generals and most infamous traitors. This 2018 Yale University release was held by Led Edward Lengel, another biography biographer of Arnold, as, quote, the most balanced and insightful assessment of Benedict Arnold to date. Utilizing fresh manuscript sources, Brumwell reasserts the crucial importance of human agency in history. And again, you can see some of the other rave reviews uh, on the slide. Today, Dr. Brumwell joins us to discuss his 2005 book, White Devil, 
a true story of war, savagery, and vengeance in colonial America. Predictably, this work has garnered wide praise from both sides of the Atlantic. According to a Washington Times reviewer, quote, in the right hands, truth, or at any rate fact, can be just as thrilling as fiction. Those hands here belong to Stephen Brumwell, unquote. In addition to his formidable array of acclaimed books, Dr. Brumwell is also a regular reviewer of new history releases for the Wall Street Journal and is a frequent on-screen contributor for the Smithsonian Channel and other networks that offer historical programming. Last year, Dr. Brumwell served as historical consultant to Disney Studios' Predator requel, Prey, which was set against the background of the conflict between the Comanches and French-Canadian trappers in the early 1700s. It gives me enormous pleasure to welcome from his base, six time zones away in Amsterdam, Netherlands, Dr. Stephen Brumwell. Now, hello everyone. I hope you can uh, see me, and see and hear me, uh, okay. And uh, what I'd like to do today is share with you the story of Robert Rogers, who is the local character, the centerpiece actually, of my book White Devil. And the reason I thought he might make a good character to talk about today for the history, culture and diversity series of lectures is the fact that he's a very divisive figure who kind of spanned different uh, cultures. He was divisive in his own lifetime, which is the second half of, you know, he was prominent in the second half of the 18th century. And he's remained divisive ever since. I should explain that I was drawn to his story, the, the arc of his life, because in a way it's a, it's a very tragic story. It encompasses peaks and troughs, peaks of, of, of fame, real hardship, and then real adversity. And Roger's himself, of course, is someone who knew the area in which the Finger Lakes Community College is based, and that surrounding district. He knew that area very well. It was the background to some of his most enduring exploits. So hopefully in the next 45 minutes or so, I'll try and give you uh, some background on Rogers and why I think he is significant and what I think his career tells us about 18th century uh, North America and especially his interactions with Native Americans on the colonial frontier of New York. I should explain also that before I went to university, I was a, a journalist. I worked as a newspaper reporter from the age of 18. I only went to university when I was 30, so I was a bit of an old oldster compared with many of the others. I was what they called a mature student. So what I've always tried to do with my books is to base them on archival research, but at the same time tell the story in a way that can be understood by non-specialists. So that's what I'll hopefully try and do with my talk today. So what I'll do is just sketch in the historical background, really, to why Robert Re Rogers became prominent. This image here is a, a modern painting of an episode which happened in 1755, known as Braddock's Defeat. Basically, the, the background to this was that Britain and France had been enemies for going back really till to the 1680s most recently when Louis XIV became locked in a power struggle with of England, subsequently Britain, and also the Dutch. But there was a series of wars in Europe, and each of those wars in Europe triggered a kind of a continental sideshow, uh, a, a colonial sideshow, I should say, in North America, where Britain, 
had established colonies going back to the 1620s. And the French had also established, at much the same time, their own colonial possessions in Canada. So by the time that Rod Robert Rogers was born in 1731, there had already been several colonial conflicts, King William's War, Queen Anne's War, King George's War. These were all named after the, the monarchs reigning in Britain at the time. But by the 1750s, things had escalated to a, a whole new level, really, because the British became very worried about the French trying to take over the Ohio country. And this became a real zone of friction. So what the British did, they scaled up their intervention. And for the first time, they sent regular British troops, a couple of regiments of redcoats, as you can see, see here, to try and, to try and uh, intervene and to kick the French out once and for all. Well, as you can probably gather from this image here, things didn't really go quite to plan. General Braddock, who was sent over to command the expedition to go to the Forks of the Ohio, which is where Pittsburgh is now, he got very close to his target, but as he was making his final advance, he ran into uh, an enemy force composed of uh, a small number of French troops, but mostly composed of Native Americans who were uh, allied to the French. And he was caught in a situation in the forest where his column was not really ambushed because it was more of a head-on collision, but it was subjected to a very, you know, very uh, disconcerting crossfire. And Braddock's troops, he had a mixture of troops. He had Virginian locally raised Virginian troops, but the, the backbone of his, of his army was composed of British regular troops, so-called redcoats. And we can see a contemporary painting here of, of some of them, grenadiers. And then we also see uh, a modern painting of British troops trying to get a grip on the kind of conditions they, they encountered in America. Now, not wishing to simplify things too far, but British regular troops, like most regular soldiers at this period, European regulars, were trained to fight in linear formations. They were disciplined. You marched up as close as, as you could to the enemy. Uh, and as long as your discipline lasted, you poured in musket fire against the enemy. It was really a question of who would hold out the longest, who would break. So really, discipline and training was at the heart of the military experience. But of course, when these troops ended up fighting in the wilderness, the forests of North America, they were in a, an environment which was totally alien to them. And Braddock's defeat in 1755, in which about two thirds of the, the men with him were killed or wounded, became something of a kind of a, an example of what could happen to regular troops who weren't familiar with the North American wilderness, particularly troops who became completely bewildered by an enemy they couldn't see, an enemy who knew how to use cover, an enemy who they couldn't see but who could be heard very clearly because the enemy they were fighting were basically considered of Native American warriors. We see here a couple of images. The one on the left is a modern reconstruction of a, a Mi'kmaq warrior from the area which is now Nova Scotia. And you can see this, this warrior is wearing a mixture of traditional Indian costume. He's got a traditional tribal, uh, his hair is dressed in a traditional tribal way. And he's wearing leggings and moccasins. But he's also wearing uh, a trade blanket probably manufactured in England, and a trade shirt. But he's armed with a musket, a tomahawk, and he's got his powder horn. On the right-hand side, you see what I think is probably an Ottawa warrior from the area of the Great Lakes. And this was based on a... This is a sketch 
taken during the siege of Quebec in 1759 by a, a British officer, George Townsend. So this is actually an eyewitness image, and it shows a warrior. It says uh, an Indian war chieftain completely equipped with a scalp in his hand. And you see he's clutching a scalp. And this aspect of Native American warfare was something which had a real psychological impact upon British soldiers who were unfamiliar with the American wilderness because it an injected an aspect, uh, an in unfamiliar aspect into warfare which was very much regulated by certain rules and codes of conduct. So basically, British Army that found itself in North America had somehow to adapt to an unfamiliar environment and to unfamiliar enemies. So how do you do this? One of the ways you do this, which armies have tri traditionally done, is to enlist as allies the very kind of people you're fighting. So if you can get some Native Americans on your side, you can use them to as a sort of an antidote to the enemy you're fighting. The great problem here was the, the British struggled compared to the French to enlist significant numbers of Native American allies. Uh, one of the most basic reasons was that the, the British, the, Engli the Anglo-American colonists east of the Appalachian chains far outnumbered the French and they were seen as far more of a threat in terms of overtaking tribal territory. Another reason was that the Iroquois Confederacy, across very much the zone where you are back in the, the mid-18th century, who had traditionally been sympathetic towards the British and antagonistic towards the French, at this time were following a policy of neutrality. They, weren't, they didn't want to get involved in the war, so they were watching from the sidelines. So really, the potential Native American allies for the British Army were very limited. So they had to find skilled bushfighters, wilderness uh, warriors, if you like, from a different source. So where do you look? I quickly wanted to show you, actually, I, the, 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 the previous images I'd shown you were uh, kind of showing Native American warriors. Of course, there, were, there was a different side to Native American culture, which is shown, I think, more sympathetically in these images from the 1770s, which show an Abenaki couple wearing their traditional uh, tribal costume, and also an Algonquin couple. Here we, c we see similar elements to in the previous pictures, but I think it just provides a little bit more cultural balance. These are eyewitness paintings made by a German officer in Montreal during the Revolutionary War, during the 1770s. And Native American culture clearly fascinated Europeans. So we do have some interesting surviving images and also descriptions of Native American culture. Now, moving on to the whole question of how do you compensate for the lack of skilled people who can operate in the North American wilderness, we move on to the, basically the formation of what became known as the Rangers. And going back to 1755, in the wake of Braddock's defeat, pretty much at the same, just a few months after Braddock's defeat, another Anglo-American expedition was fighting in the, the Hudson Valley, the Champlain Valley, under William Johnson. And this army actually did manage to fend off a French and Native American force at what is known as the Battle of Lake George. But rather than being able to move on from there, Johnson was baffled by a lack of intelligence about French operations. And the French were, were at the other end of, of, of Lake George, digging in around what became the site for Fort Ticonderoga, whereas I'm sure many of you will know there's now a very impressive uh, reconstructed fort. So what he needed were people to go out and scout. And one of the people who stepped forward was a young 
uh, Massachusetts born uh, man from Scotch Irish stock, Robert Rogers. He was in his 20s at this time. But Roger, Ro Robert Rogers made his name quite swiftly as someone who was willing to go out on scouts into hostile territory at the head of small, yeah, relatively small scouts of men. And he would gather intelligence, perhaps capture a French soldier, bring him back for interrogation. And quite rapidly, the, the colonial American press, the newspaper industry, if, if you like, by this stage, cities like Boston, New York, each had several newspapers. Most of the colonies had its own newspaper. And they rapidly picked up on Robert Rogers as someone who they were keen to write about because he would prepare reports of his various scouts. And for people who are living in Philadelphia or New York and who'd never seen Native Americans who were far away from the frontier, this was pretty exciting stuff. And also, at this time, the war was going very badly for the Anglo-Americans. British armies had been defeated. The French were mopping up various outposts like Oswego. Uh, the French really, and their Native American allies, seemed to have the dominant hand. So Rogers, really, in an era where there wasn't an awful lot of good news going on, was someone whose profile was in the ascendant. And because of this, he was noticed very much by British commanders. They decided that the, what, what they wanted to do was use the model of Robert Rangers' first company and to expand it into a kind of a battalion-sized corps. And I think what was interesting about Rogers, he dressed his men basically as this figure. This is a modern reconstruction, but it shows a ranger dressed in green. He's got elements of Indian-style clothing, Native American-style clothing. But what is interesting about the rangers is that Rogers was very keen to incorporate Native Americans within his own ranging, ranging organization. And I mentioned before, there weren't that many Native Americans available to the British, but there were communities of, of long-established Christianized Native Americans in Connecticut and also in Massachusetts. The Mohicans of Connecticut and the Mahicans of Massachusetts, not Mohicans, neither of them, but these were were people who were very keen to serve under Rogers, and they've, they were organized in their own companies, as you can see here, wearing their own native dress. And interestingly, they served under their own native officers, unlike, for example, black troops during the Civil War, who were part of the Union forces, but were commanded by white officers. Rogers's native companies were actually commanded by their own tribal leaders and are also paid the same as the rangers, which I think is very interesting. And the rangers themselves were paid at twice the rate of the redcoats. So these were actually expensive specialist troops. And what we see in the course of the next couple of years, 56, 57 through to 1758, Rogers is leading his rangers on increasingly upscaled missions into French territory. And as he does so, he becomes more and more prominent as a figure in the colonial press. You first of all see them talking about uh, Captain Rogers. Then it is the brave Captain Rogers. Then he's promoted to major in charge of six companies. And then in, his name starts to appear in bold type, in, in, in bold capitals. So really, he's becoming quite a prominent figure. Now, Rogers, his profile really rises in 1758 when the British decide that they really need to do something about the French. They, they launch uh, offensive offensives on various fronts, on three different fronts. Uh, 
and uh, they actually get themselves in a position where they're ready by 1759 to try and conquer New France, to try and conquer French Canada by advancing on various fronts. And one of the things that Rogers has been very keen to do is to attack the French Abenaki mission village of St. Francis, which is in the St. Lawrence Valley, very close to the St. Lawrence, Lawrence River, between Montreal and Quebec. And now there's quite an interesting backstory, and I just wanted to talk a little bit about the Abenaki themselves, just to explain why their particular mission village became such a, a high-profile target. The Abenaki themselves had originally, the so-called people of the Dawnland, had originally inhabited tribal lands in New England, but like a lot of tribes, they were gradually pushed further north because of the uh, the increased settlement of their original tribal territories. And during the 1670s, 1675, 76, what was known as King Philip's War in New England uh, was a time of great dislocation for many native people, some of whom were completely eradicated. Others, like the Abenaki, were pushed further and further back. One of the consequences was that the, the Abenaki sought refuge with the French in Canada. And the French, through their Jesuit priests, the so-called black robes, were very keen to try and convert native peoples to Christianity, to the Catholic, to Catholicism. And the Abenaki gravitated towards the mission villages in the St. Lawrence Valley, and St. Francis became one of the most popular amongst uh, the Abenaki. Now, the Abenaki became Catholics, but and they became staunch allies of the French. And one of the ways they expressed this uh, allegiance with the French was by participating in raids on British communities on the Massachusetts and New York frontiers. One of the most uh, significant raids, which is here shown in a, a modern reconstruction, was against Deerfield in Massachusetts in 1704. Basically, this was during what was known as Queen Anne's War, one of the colonial offshoots of the, the War of the Spanish Succession, was, which was raging in Europe. This was one of many raids which were organized by the French in which uh, native warriors participated. The basic aim was you would hit a community, you would destroy the community, you would take captives, and you would bring them back to Canada. And the point was that you would basically show that you were in control, and it would demoralize the, the Anglo-Americans. It would force back settlement. And i switch to another. This is just basically, I want to talk a little bit about captivity. Captivity, the way it basically worked was that Native American war bands would take captives, men, women, and children, take them back to their villages, depending on what was going on at the time, uh, whether the situ situation involved warfare or was, or whether the native community had itself suffered losses, then perhaps some of the male captives would be killed. But often or not, captives would be adopted into the the tribe, particularly women and children or young men who were seen as as basically people who were likely to adapt to tribal life. And the Abenaki of St. Francis, they actually had, because they had been raiding the, the frontier communities of New, New England and New York for a considerable time, had actually by 1759, which is what we're talking about, had uh, adapted and adopted, I should say, quite a percentage of people from 
European background. So it was actually quite a mixed community, which I think underlines his idea of cultural diversity. So this image, of course, shows sort of a, ne a negative as aspect of the captive uh, procedure. But once captives were actually in involved in their communities, they could actually be absorbed quite rapidly. And at the period I'm talking about, one of the chiefs of the St. Francis Abenaki was Louis Joseph Gill, and both of his parents were white. They were white captives who'd been taken in raids on New England. So you have a chief, a chieftain, who is actually basically white. Yet, because he is given this status based upon his hunting ability, his abilities as a warrior, I think it shows quite an, uh, an open acceptance of, of different individuals. Now, what I want to talk about briefly, because we've, we've, we've gone through quite a bit of time, this is just a map, which hopefully you can see okay, which shows the area I'm going to be talking about when I look at what became known as the St. Francis Raid, basically in 1759, when the British were besieging Quebec under General Wolfe, and General Geoffrey Amherst was advancing on the Lake George front, and also an expedition had been sent against the French fort at Niagara. On the this front here, the Lake George front, things were things were a bit stalemated. The, the British had captured Fort Carillon, which they renamed Ticonderoga, and also, also Fort St. Frederick, which was renamed Crown Point. But that was about the limit of their movement on that front. So whilst the siege of Quebec was going on, in fact, whilst it was actually coming to its climax, General Amherst authorised Robert Rogers to take 200 or more of his rangers and attack St. Francis, which you can see here positioned uh, east of Montreal, quite close to uh, the St. Lawrence River. But the way that Rogers was going to approach was by Lake Champlain and to the northern end of Lake Champlain. Then he would uh, land his men at Missisquoi Bay and then take a route overland. Now this is basically what happened. He left Crown Point on the 13th September 1759. Although there were French, small French warships on Lake Champlain, he managed to give them the slip and he landed at Missisquoi Bay where he hid his whale boats, his kind of rowing boats amongst the, the brush, hoping initially to return to them. Then what he did, you can see there's this dotted line, and it crosses a lot of rivers, and basically Rogers went on a great sweep to try and achieve an element of surprise. But as he rapidly discovered, he was crossing extremely swampy territory. It was a great, what he described, a, a great spruce swamp. So it was extremely hard going. And he discovered when he'd been out for a couple of days, that French scouts had found his whaleboats hidden at Missisquoi Bay. So there was no way he would be able to return to them. And they were actually in pursuit of him. So he decided to push on. And he finally got out of the swamps. By this stage, he'd lost about 40 men from his original force of about 200. And he decided he was going to cross the St. Francis River and then try and surprise the village of St. Francis itself. And he arrived within striking distance of St. Francis on the 3rd of October. At this stage, a lot of the warriors from St. Francis were nearby at Yamaska, which you can see was just across the St. Francis River. They'd been told that Rogers would be approaching by that route, and they were hoping to ambush him there. And other warriors from St. Francis were still with the French at Quebec, so they were quite distant. So St. Francis, from the, what the sources tell us, there was some kind of feast going on that night. Now, the, 
the bulk of the evidence suggests that it was actually a wedding feast. And when we look about when we look at this period of history, most of the sources we can draw upon are those which were written by the British and to a lesser extent by the French. I've also I've already mentioned that the British by this stage already had in North America quite an established newspaper industry. So there's some very interesting reports on what was going on. The French, interestingly, didn't have newspapers in Canada. And but they did of course have correspondence going backwards and forwards between various officers and certain individuals kept journals. So we have very strong evidence from the Europeans. The Native American schools, the Abenaki, uh, did not have that same kind of literary culture. They did have an oral culture and oral history from this period does survive. And there are various sources which were recorded uh, back in the 1950s by a, a man called Gordon Day who actually went amongst the Abenaki with a tape recorder and he took down oral history and certain patterns emerge. For example, one of the stories is that there were Abenaki women who were wash doing their washing in the St. Francis River and they noticed that wood chips were floating down towards St. Lawrence and the likely explanation for this is that when Rogers first hit the St. Lawrence, some of, some of his men began building rafts, but then they stopped when they realized that wood chips floating down would indeed be a bit of a giveaway. And the, the Abenaki women did report this to their menfolk, but they weren't listened to seriously. As I've mentioned, a lot of the menfolk were actually away. Another one of the the oral history stories which does seem to be very coherent because it occurs in several different versions is that the inhabitants of St. Francis were actually warned on the eve of Rogers's attack by one of his Native American rangers, a Mahican, who didn't like the thought that the, this community was going to be attacked. So he gave them a warning and many of the women and children actually did go and hide in neighboring woods, but not everyone took the warning on board. Uh, in the early hours of, well, at dawn on the 4th of October, Rogers attacked St. Francis. He surprised the village, or Odenac, as it was known to the Abenaki. He surprised it and he burned it, killed, well, the estimate is probably about, Rogers said he'd killed about 200 of the inhabitants, but that is an inflated figure, probably f far more likely a maximum of 40. And he burned the village, he took 20 captives, and because by now the hornet's nest had been stirred up, he then had to retreat from St. Francis and somehow get back to friendly territory. We already know he couldn't go back to Missisquoi Bay because Rogers knew that his whale boats had been discovered. So he dis decided to go back uh, a different route by via Lem Lake uh, Memphremagog and basically to strike the Connecticut River and then follow the Connecticut River back down to friendly territory. Now, this is a modern reconstruction painting, but in the course of his retreat, of course, Rogers was pursued by war parties composed of vengeful Abenaki and also French militia, French Canadian militia and regular troops. So they were forced to fight for part of the way. But Rogers managed to shake off the bulk of the pursuers, but he was faced then with the problem that his supplies had run out before he even reached St. Francis. And although him and his men managed to corn at St. Francis. It was only enough for a few days. By the time they got out into the wilderness, they were basically, their group of about 150 men was scaring off all of the game, such as it was, that was in the woods. They couldn't really hunt. So he decided the best thing to do was split his command up into smaller parties, which would have a better chance of hunting. But of course, these smaller parties were far more vulnerable to attack by 
the pursuers. And one of the parties was under a chap called Lieutenant Dunbar, was uh, virtually wiped out, and other parties were broken up. But then those that had survived split up, took different paths to try and make their way back to safety. Some of them did find their way back to Crown Point, going by hugging Lake Champlain. Rogers' own party struck, eventually, the Connecticut River, where he'd arranged with General Amherst that an officer would be waiting for him with supplies. But when he got there, at a, to, at a place called the Cohaz Intervals on the Connecticut River, there was a si there were signs that someone had been there. There was a f smoldering fire, but there were no supplies for his men, and they were already by this stage starving and really at the very end of their tether. And Rogers decided that the only way to get assistance would be to construct a raft and to go down the Connecticut River just with a couple of men and get supplies from Fort Number 4, which you can just see, I think I've marked it on the map, and then to go back up the river and get supplies to his men. This, incredibly, he did, and he arrived in time to actually provide uh, sustenance to men who were basically starving. And then he helped get those men back to Fort Number 4. Now, when news of this hit the colonial press, the fact that uh, Rogers had not only burned down St. Francis, but had actually come back into Fort Number 4, this created quite a sensation. And this was the, this is a clip from the New York Gazette, November the 26th, and it says, the following account of the indefatigable and brave Major Rogers, bold type, last scout against the St. Francis Indians must be agreeable to our readers. The journal is authentic, wrote by himself at number four, November the 1st. So this is an example of the kind of impact that Robert Rogers had upon contemporary Americans. And this report not only circulated through the North American colonies, but it was picked up by the British newspapers in London and Edinburgh. So Rogers really, by this stage, as a result of the St. Francis raid, it's safe to say that he was probably one of the most famous men in North America. He was certainly more famous than George Washington, if that puts it into perspective. Now, the war with the French came to an end in 1760, although the fighting in North America didn't come to an end uh, in 1763, there was this episode known as Pontiac's War, which was basically a kind of a, a Native American war of independence against the Anglo-American land grab, which achieved a lot, but it eventually fizzled out by because at this stage, Native Americans were very much dependent upon trade goods like gunpowder for hunting. So when they were unable to get the kind of trade goods that they had originally been able to obtain from the French, who are now eliminated from the equation, their war effort petered out. Robert Rogers participated in what was known as Pontiac's War. And in 1765, when, over, when he was actually in England, he published a book about what he'd, he'd, he'd uh, been up to in North America, you see the, the title page here, The Journals of Major Robert Rogers, where he basically drew upon the various newspaper reports of the skirmishes and also the larger expeditions like the St. Francis Raid, which he'd been involved in. And this increased his celebrity in England, he was actually in introduced to King George III. So he was quite a celebrity, but at the same time, Rogers, when the war finished, like a lot of men who basically become celebrities as a result of their explo exploits as soldiers, he found peace and the lack of adventure, a lack of excitement 
very difficult to handle. Basically, you know, he also was someone who'd run up debts because although he was a good soldier, he wasn't a very good administrator. And money he owed from expeditions he tried to put forward during the, the, the war with France came back to haunt him. So he ended up in debt to his prison. Also, he started to have a bit of a drink problem and he became basically uh, an alcoholic, which fed into the whole debt problem as well. So by the early 1770s, Rogers was in problems. He really was a shadow of his former self. By 1775, when Britain and her former American colonies were on the brink of war, Rogers offered himself to Congress as someone who wanted to fight against the British. But George Washington, who was to become the, the leader of the Continental Army fighting against Britain, was suspicious of Rogers. We don't really know 100% why, but he, he didn't really want to take Rogers on board. As a result, Rogers became uh, a loyalist. He threw in his cause with the British and... He never really reached the heights he had done during the previous war against the French. And when Britain lost the war, he went back with the British to London, and in 1795, he died there, basically a washed-up, alcoholic shadow of the old Rogers. It's a very tragic story, really. But in North America, of course, Rogers had been completely overshadowed by the new, a new generation of heroes, the men who'd fought in the Revolutionary War, men like Washington, men like Rogers's old colleague John Stark, men who basically become celebrities through fighting against the British. Now, that situation went on for quite a while, but in the 19th century, there was a famous North American historian, Francis Parkman, who wrote a book called Montcalm and Wolf about what was known as the French and Indian War. And in this account of the French and Indian War, Robert Rogers became a key figure. And Francis Parkman was office, who was writing, you know, who was, became prominent in the 1850s, 60s, was particularly fascinated by the character of Rogers. And at this period, although Rogers wasn't a particularly, he wasn't a, a hero on, in the mainstream. He was still something of a folk hero. There were places in the landscape that were named after him. Rogers Rock off Lake George, Rogers Slide, where he'd once apparently slid down on his snowshoes after being defeated by the French and Indians. He was still, he was still there embedded in the landscape. So Francis Parkman, picked up on this. And in the 19th century, you can see in this slide here, there was a book, Northwest Passage by Kenneth Roberts, who lived in Maine, and he wrote in the 1930s, and this novel here that says, the greatest novel of America ever written. Well, I think Herman Melville might have quibbled with that, along with several other authors, but this novel was made into a film, Northwest Passage, by King Vidor, starring Spencer Tracy. And this was one of the first Technicolor movies, I understand. And this had a real impact. And you can still watch it, I believe, on YouTube now. And this had quite an impact on resurrecting Rogers as a sort of a frontier hero. And you can see from the film poster that he's like this kind of quintessential buckskinned uh, frontier figure. And he became so influential that Robert Rogers' Rules for Ranging, which he'd originally brought out in the 1750s as a way of trying to co codify his ranging techniques, were actually issued to American forces in Vietnam as a way of fighting, not in the, the forest, but in the jungle in that instance, but because they embodied these rules of irregular warfare, which were kind of timeless. You know, you use concealment. You walk in single file. You do not bunch. You circle around. You, you basically don't make yourself a sitting target. Because although they've been put together 
200 or more years before, they still embodied those essential truths. Now, going back to my original point about Rogers being a divisive figure, he still very much is. And what I was trying to do uh, in White Devil was to tell his story based upon the facts, as far as I could find them, based upon what people actually wrote at the time, rather than what people would write with agendas, whether that agenda is glorifying Rogers or whether that agenda is vilifying him as some kind of uh, frontier villain. So I think his story is interesting. I think there are uh, aspects... You know, he was a very enigmatic character, and I think the problem is complicated by the fact that when he wrote about himself... He was a very good self-publicist. He didn't really tell the whole truth. What I tried to do in White Devil was to give a balanced version of his story. And hopefully that's what I've tried to do in my talk today. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much, Dr. Brumwell. Um, we've got some a few minutes for question and answer. Um, Feel free to unmute your mic and uh, pose your question directly to Dr. Brumwell, or if you're more comfortable, uh, you can type something into the chat and I will read it to him. So we do have one in the chat. Um, why did you choose to study this time period? And it is sort of interesting, you know, a Brit fascinated by colonial American history. Yeah, that's a, that's a very good question. Thank you very much. Yeah, uh, I've always been interested in history, but I never had a, a specific interest in colonial or revolutionary American history. The reason I went on to uh, study at university was because when I was a kid, there was a, a very low-budget BBC version of The Last of the Mohicans. Now, it's nowhere comparable with a the Daniel Day-Lewis epic that we're all familiar with now. But it had very memorable scenes. So me and my friends would run around the playgrounds attempting to scalp each other and mimicking these various scenes. But it always had an impact on me. And, of course, most of my contemporaries, we were very familiar with the Wild West, this idea of, of Native Americans with feathered war bonnets riding horses. But I always found... The idea of, of warfare in the, the North American forests, uh, the forests of Eastern North America, far more interesting. And so when I went to university, I didn't initially think I would have the opportunity to conduct research. But because I ended up doing better with my first degree than I'd anticipated, I, I was given the opportunity to do that. And so when I did get the chance to do research, I thought, well, I know what I'm going to be interested in researching. So yeah, that's basically why I was interested in that period of history. But since then, you know, my last book was about Benedict Arnold. So it's kind of grown in a way. So I think I've I've tried to push that as far as I could take it. But my interest in history is is much more wide ranging. As as Robert mentioned, I review history books for the Wall Street Journal, and I've really, I've done, a lot of the books I've, I've covered for them have been about medieval history, for example. So, yeah, but that's basically the answer to your question. It's interesting, you referenced Last of the Mohicans, which I think a lot of the our audience members are, are familiar with, having read the Fenimore Cooper book or, or seen the film. And there is a connection between the massacre of, of the British uh, at Fort William Henry and what happens at St. Francis. Is, is that correct? Yeah, I mean, it's something I, I, I talk about in the book. In fact, when Rogers was sent against St. Francis, he was told to take his revenge. And one of the things he was taking revenge for was the massacre at Fort William Henry, which, of course, is one of the most memorable scenes in the movie version, Michael Mann's version of Last of the Mohicans. And, of course, there's a big debate about just how much of a massacre it really was. But I think even when you take it at its, its kind of least massacre level, for want of a better 
way of expressing it, it was still significant enough to cause, have caused a bit of a, a stir at the time. So that was something that definitely uh, was picked up upon by the colonial press. It was seen as something of a war crime that had to be avenged. Anybody else have a question? There's one in the chat. Um, I think it's on many minds. What's your current project, or what are you working on next? Are we up to the War of 1812 now? <laughs> no, I'm, I've, I've, to be honest, I've never really, no, no offense to the War of 1812, but it's never really, it doesn't have the same appeal for me. Uh, I've got various ideas for books, but it's, you know, it's becoming increasingly difficult to place books if you're not a big name author and you don't have a well-connected agent. I don't want to make that sound discouraging for anyone who's hoping to write a book. But, uh, and also there's so much competition, particularly with the 250th anniversary of the Revolutionary War coming up uh, in the next couple of years. I, I guarantee you there'll be a real glut of books about the Revolutionary War. So I'm, I'm more interested in writing about something a little bit different, maybe even trying to write a screenplay. You know, I, we were, I was talking to Robert earlier about Ridley Scott's Napoleon, and despite being a, having a 200 million dollar budget, apparently they didn't manage to get a decent script. So, you know, I think there's all kinds of uh, things out there you can try your hand at. So perhaps that's something I might uh, dabble in. But basically, I'm interested in storytelling, so there's various ways of, of, of doing that. Any other questions? Don't don't be shy. No, don't be shy. Uh, you know, it's still early here in Amsterdam. Otherwise, I'm going to have to go and hit the nightclubs and uh, whatever. <laughs> I'm only joking. I've got to cook dinner. <laughs> As someone who teaches medical history here at the college, uh, I was very interested in the reference that you make in the book to, you know, Lord Amherst considering, I'm not sure how sort of genuine this consideration was, but using mm. smallpox uh, infected blankets in order to suppress Pontiac's rebellion. Have yep. you found other evidence of that during the French and Indian Wars or after? Well, the whole question of Amherst deliberately seeking to infect or to deliberately seeking to cause an ep a smallpox epidemic. There, there are letters that went back and forth saying, yes, this would be good. Can we not get some blankets from the smallpox hospital? Because, of course, at this time, smallpox was rife, was a real uh, killer. I mean, people who had no immunity to, to smallpox were very, very susceptible, of course, particularly native peoples. And uh, we know, for example, when Fort William Henry was captured, there were a lot of uh, Native Americans who'd come from the Great Lakes, and they took captives amongst the, uh, the garrison of Fort William Henry. They'd also taken scalps. And we know that the garrison of Fort William Henry had, had people who'd been suffering from smallpox. So what happened was uh, smallpox was basically taken back to those communities, which is why very, very few Native Americans turned up to support the French in 1758, because a smallpox epi epidemic was going on uh, out in the Great Lakes. But yeah, going back to whether Amherst deliberately tried to uh, use biological warfare, if we can call it that, yeah, there's a lot of evidence that even if he didn't actually manage to do it, he certainly would have liked to have done it. So yeah, there are letters passing back and forth saying, yeah, this would be, it would be good if we could do this. So the intention is is definitely there. So, but the situation Amherst is quite interesting because he's someone who didn't hate Native Americans initially, but because a lot of uh, his officers ended up being killed by Native Americans in the course of the war, he gradually became one of these people who ended up seeing Native Americans as the savages who had to be taken out by any means possible. 
And so basically the war did become, from the Europeans' perspective, became very much, well, whatever you need to do to end the war, you do it. So I actually start my book, White Devil, with a graffito that was found carved on a tree out in the wilderness by a French trapper, basically, which says, we are all savages. And I was interested to see in the film The Revenant, I don't know if anyone here saw that movie, but they have a Native American featured in that film who ends up hanging, but he's got a sign hang around his neck, Nous sommes tous sauvages, we are all savages. Whether or not they took it from White Devil, I don't know. It, they, maybe they did that independently. But the point I was really trying to make was people engaged in that environment, that kind of warfare, end up becoming, adopting the same kind of approaches to, to warfare. So, yeah, that's the whole smallpox question, I think, is very interesting. And there was a very good book about, I think it's called Pox Americana by Elizabeth Fenn, which is all about smallpox in revolutionary America. I think she focuses on the Revolutionary War, but I'm sure she will have a chapter dealing with that uh, smallpox, uh, the blankets uh, during Pontiac's war, which I'm sure she will give you the full evidence for that. Great, thank you. Any, I think we've got to have a one more question if anybody has uh, wants to unmike. Or well, anything in general, it doesn't have to be about Rogers, could be about history in general or writing or... I had to ask, what is your main drive to study history in general? Uh, yeah, that's, that's a good point. Uh, I mentioned earlier when I was talking about, you know, why the 18th century. I mean, I've always been interested in history, and it sounds a bit corny, but I think when I, you know, when I was very, very small... I was given this tiny book in my Christmas stocking, uh, which is about King Henry V of England, who's famous through Shakespeare. But it was a ladybird book. These were books for kids. So each double page spread had a page of text and he had an illustration. It was basically a picture book. But yeah, I thought, yeah, I, I, this is really cool. I really like this. So I, you know, I then started, and, and, and Robert mentioned, I was born in an area where history's all around you. Porchester Castle started off as a Roman fort. The Roman walls, you know, originally built in 350 AD, are still there, you know, and uh, meters high. And there's a, a Norman keep in the corner. And during the Napoleonic Wars, the French prisoners of war were kept there. You know, you've got the whole history of Britain and Europe in, in, in one within a certain space. And in Portsmouth itself, where I was born, you go to South Sea Common, you've got a, a fort that was built by King Henry VIII. And he was on the ramparts of that fort when he watched his great warship, the Mary Rose, sink to the bottom of the, the English Channel. And so history really is all around you. You've got pubs out in the countryside which were built in 1500. And, uh, you know, before the, the English even started to colonize North America. So I guess I just got the history bug at an early age. Some people, for example, might have got the science bug. Or I have to say, judging by my performance at school, there's no way, I, at maths, for example, there's no way I, I could ever become a scientist, even if I was interested in astronomy. But I think history captured my imagination. I, th I don't know if that answers your question, but that's basically no. me. No, I, I'd have to agree with you there. I, especially with the kid, part where you said history capture your imagination, I'm on the same boat there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I think what I've, what I've tried to do, I mean, I could never write about an aspect of history that didn't interest me. For example, I'm not interested in, you know, English polit British political reform in the mid-19th century or the power struggle between... Jefferson and Adams, you know, a lot of people are, and they write best-selling books about that stuff, but it doesn't uh, doesn't ring my bell. Excellent. Well, thank you very much uh, to Dr. Brumwell and for everyone for for coming out and attending this uh, history, culture, and diversity event. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for listening, and have a good day. Thank you. <laughs>